What, a, what an absolutely fabulous crowd, and the energy is just, just palpable. It makes me feel so enthusiastic. I am Lynn Scarlett, Global Managing Director of Public Policy for the Nature Conservancy. And it is my tremendous privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell. Just over a year ago, many here today joined Secretary Jewell for the Press Club announcement of her landmark policy on landscape scale planning on public lands. We assemble here today, each of us, recognizing that nature knows no boundaries. We comprehend that natural resource management challenges unfold at large scales. We perceive that issues intersect. Managing lands well requires a long vision and a large tableau through which to plan, assess, and avoid, reduce, and mitigate the impacts of land uses. Secretary Jewell's pioneering policy offers the foundations for that long vision and that large tableau. I recall when Secretary Jewell's nomination was announced, and I thought, how perfect. Here is an individual who hikes and climbs and paddles along the trails and waters of our spectacular public lands. Indeed, I'm told she has scaled Mount Rainier seven times and counting. Here is a person as former CEO of REI with a background in business and leadership of a large organization. And here's a person with expertise in energy and natural resources. Guiding the Department of the Interior requires a passion for the mission. It requires management acumen. Some don't know the vital statistics of the department. It's a large organization, 70,000 employees, 165,000 facilities, a presence in over 2,000 locations. It requires vision of the future and its possibilities. These are the qualities that Secretary Jewell brings to her role. During her speech a year ago to announce her large landscape planning policy, Secretary Jewell also talked of the future. She spoke of children. She spoke of the imperative of assuring that each and every child could touch the natural world, come to know its textures and sounds, stretch out and go along trails or a walk in the woods. Many at this conference are advancing conservation partnerships and collaborate across large landscapes to sustain healthy lands, water, and wildlife. Sustaining these lands and waters is not just nice. Sustaining them is essential for communities and wildlife. But healthy lands, waters, and wildlife are also a legacy for our children. Efforts to conserve and manage lands at landscape scales help assure that our children and their children thereafter will be able to walk along a trail, view pronghorns silvery under a western sky, fish in clear streams, and through smart development, enjoy clean energy. Secretary Jewell, we profoundly thank you for your leadership in this endeavor. Let us offer a hearty welcome to Secretary Jewell. Thank you, Lynn, and wow, what a crowd this is. Who knew? This is a very large landscape of people. So it is my pleasure to be here, and uh, that was a really lovely introduction that Lynn gave me. Lynn Scarlett, uh, certainly a year and a half ago, probably still today, knows the Department of Interior very, very well. She was Deputy Secretary. She took her time and talents and brought them to the Nature Conservancy. She's a true proponent of large landscape 
Conservation, and she's co-chair of the National Council for Landscape Conservation Cooperatives. So, Lynn, you're just the gift that keeps on giving. Thank you very much for your work. I also want to thank Jim Levitt. It is really hard to put on a conference like this. Uh, organizers of conferences, and I'm sure there are a few of you out there really understand what that means, but uh, Jim reminded me that he hit me up to speak at this conference. I've forgotten all about this when we were ran into each other in passing at the uh, National uh, Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. So you pulled it off. Congratulations. This is a great crowd. Um, there are lots of wonderful people in this room that are part of the choir, part of the choir that understands how we need to work together. We need to work a lot smarter on protecting and understanding these landscapes that are iconic in this country that help define who we are, but also help us help the rest of the world understand what's at stake. So I've got a number of colleagues from the Department of Interior here. You've heard from a couple of them. Uh, you heard recently, I think, for those of you that were in the breakout from Joel Clement and uh, Jim Lyons. Um, Joel, as the uh, director of the Office of Policy Analysis, has put a lot of pens to paper around landscape level mitigation and what this means for our strategy. Uh, Jim Lyons, working closely with me and Michael Bean and others on sage grouse conservation in the West. Uh, Liz Klein, Associate Deputy Secretary, has worked very hard to pull all the parts of Interior together around landscapes. I also would just like to ask my Interior colleagues to raise your hands. Could you do that? Wow, okay. <laughs> Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. You know, I want to say that uh, for my interior colleagues, could those of you that aren't in interior but are part of the federal family raise your hands here, USDA and others? These people who work for the federal government uh, do incredible work, tireless work, haven't had a meaningful raise in a very long time. We've got to deal with continuing resolutions. We've got to deal with all kinds of incoming, you know what? from uh, Capitol Hill, from the media, and yet they soldier on. They soldier on with a bigger picture, a picture that is about the future, the future of our country, the future of our planet, the future of our children, and that's why, why your work here is so important. So thank you all for uh, everything you're doing. So we have a... Uh, legacy of conservation in this country. And I think we like to think of that beginning around the turn of the last century with the likes of Teddy Roosevelt and uh, uh, Stephen Mather and Horace Albright and John Muir and many other names of people who were early conservationists. When Teddy Roosevelt was president, early on in his presidency, he named the first uh, national wildlife refuge and that was Pelican Island. It was uh, three acres with an additional two and a half acres of water around it. So that was the very first of our nation's national wildlife refuges. During his eight years in office, he uh, created five national parks, including places like Crater Lake in Oregon or Mesa Verde in Colorado. He established 150 national forests. And he was the first president to use the new Antiquities Act naming 18 national monuments, including small places like the Grand Canyon or what was Mount Olympus, now Olympic National Park. But I will tell you, as a child growing up in the Pacific Northwest, who grew up among old growth trees where our family of six couldn't even get our arms around the trunk, that it was easy as a child to take those beautiful places for granted. But there are very few of those places that my children could enjoy. And I think about the waters around Lopez Island and the San Juans. There's now a San Juan Island National Monument. It looks like we got a fan out there for the San Juans. We used to have uh, almost so many sea stars or starfish that you could barely walk around them when you scrambled up on the rocks at low tide. You go out there now and you can't find hardly a one. They've got a, a terrible disease. People are trying to understand the science behind it. But I suspect there are some powers at work around climate change that may have had an impact there. So it told me, um, as a young person growing up now into an increasingly old person, um, that our landscapes were not looked at in the holistic way that we have an opportunity to do today. We didn't always listen 
to people like John Muir in those early days, who said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. So those early days of conservation were about setting aside beautiful places, inspiring places. We all know where they are. We've probably all been to many of them. And those places like Yosemite or like Yellowstone or like the Tetons uh, became the keystones of what we now understand are part of a larger conservation ecosystem. So now here we are in the 21st century, more than a century after those early pioneers. And we know that conservation doesn't fit neatly into the boundaries of national parks or national wildlife refuges or even, frankly, national forests. We know that uh, species migrate. We actually know that plants migrate. And no, they don't pull up roots and start walking. But they are migrating. We're seeing that in parts of the California desert. We're seeing changes in our ecosystems that are profound that we need to pay attention to. So with climate change, with an increasing awareness of the importance of wildlife, hab wildlife habitat, with increasing demands on our resources, we've got to move from random acts of kindness, and I would call some of those lands that were set aside in the early years random acts of kindness or random acts of vision, to what I would say is strategic focus, and that's what you are here to talk about, and that is moving to a landscape level approach to our resources. I'll tell you that you know, when you take on a job like this and you're coming from the private sector and you really uh, are, have an awful lot of learning to do, which the great thing about this job is you never get off the steep learning curve. Every single day is like studying for a final. But one of the things you have to do early on is say you have to prioritize. You have to identify those things that you want to make progress on because you can't make progress on everything. One of the six priorities I laid out for the Department of Interior was a landscape level understanding of our resources. And that's why I support the work of all of you in this room and why it is so important. You know it's not new. Many of you have been talking about the importance of this for probably decades. But I think we have recognition today that this is now the time to move forward. When I uh, started in a major conservation effort in 1991, so 23 years ago, I was learning at the knee of uh, a well-known uh, conservationist and leader visionary in Seattle named Jim Ellis. And I remember as we were working on the Mountains to Sound Greenway, that ribbon of asphalt known as I-90, that was urbanizing very rapidly, much as I-70 did out of Denver, or all of Orange County did in California, we thought, we don't want to develop that way. And so a lot of the area had been logged. And I remember talking to Jim once uh, because we were about to do a major land exchange to sort out some of the checkerboard uh, that you have in the way our western landscapes work. And we were trading some old growth and some beautiful timber out by Mount Rainier for some stumpage along I-90. And people were critical. And Jim said to me, I can grow trees, but I can't grow land. And that is really important because now those forests are over 20 years old. In another 100 years, they will be well on their way to being old growth. They are already providing great habitat. And to quote Will Rogers, he said, they ain't making any more of the stuff, meaning land. So we got to make better use of what we have. So what's exciting is that we ha are at a time in our history where we've got a conversion of three factors that are really important. One is that recognition that this is important. Second is we have the will. We have the will in this administration under President Obama's leadership to deal with climate change, to recognize it's real, the debate is over, we're going to quit arguing about it, and we're going to get on with it. And I will tell you that's very liberating. I'll let the President know you just clapped for him. He will really appreciate that. So we have recognition of the issue. We have the will to do something about it. Uh, I feel empowered, certainly as an agency head, to move in this direction with all speed. And we have the science. We have the science to support our efforts. So I met Jim from ESRI. I can't remember when it was, Jim. I was at REI. We were at something. Do you remember? What, was it Western Governors? Okay, I was speaking at Western Governors Association. That, I'm kind of a regular there now, but that's over sage grouse. Um, but he taught me a bit about ESRI and what ESRI's doing, and, and we do... Uh, use ESRI's products at the Department of Interior. The capacity to map is huge. 
When you look at how far we've come in our capacity to use computer technology to map, that is enormous. The USGS has great tools on the ground, and you all know of their work on the ground. You probably don't recognize every time you pick up your phone and you go to Google Earth that those images, for the most part, are being brought to you by the USGS. I'd like to have a watermark on there. I've told Google this. Uh, yeah, just as uh, when you get your, when you use your weather apps, it would be awfully nice if they'd give recognition to NOAA as well for that data, because I have heard people, yeah, let's give NOAA a hand. <laughs> I have heard people say, why do we need these satellites when we've got Google Earth? You know, <laughs> why do we need the National Weather Service when we've got the Weather Channel? It's like, okay, so the federal government is lousy at marketing. That's really obvious to me. But the USGS has, uh, Landsat's been around for a long time, but we keep replacing it with new Landsat satellites. The most recent one can help us understand drought through evapotranspiration, can help us understand groundwater discharge through gravitometers that actually measure changes in the Earth's gravitational uh, field based on groundwater. They can help us look at landscapes and understand ground cover and the nature of that ground cover and the health of that. And when you combine that of work on the ground at a state level, at a federal level, uh, USDA, Forest Service, the agencies of interior, those of states, we have great information. You've got the Western governors that came out with CHAT, the Crucial Habitat Assessment Tool which is a great illustration of what we'd like to do on a broad scale around the country, which is understand all of the factors and use the technical tools available to us to be able to see those layer upon layer. What are the areas of critical habitat? What are the areas that are, are hot for development, whether it's oil and gas or wind or solar? What are the areas that may be sacred to Native American people? Uh, and maybe we don't want to publish that, but we need to know it, at least at a land management level. What are the areas that are within critical view sheds of places that people come from all over the world to visit uh, because they're so special? So with these tools, with this science, land managers, wherever they are, can make informed decisions about the impact of their development. We as land planners can say, you can develop over here, but not over there. So they come in with certainty, with clarity, with a sense of where they can develop and where they can't. And that is really, really critical. And we've got some good examples that I'll, I'll refer to in a few minutes. So between the science and the land and water management, we play a pretty big role. So does uh, USDA. We like to work in partnership with federal agencies, but also with states. So I'm going to give you a few senses of, of some four main areas we're working on interior. We will have time for questions at the end, so be thinking about those. And Lynn's going to moderate those uh, when I'm done here. So first, I want to give a shout out to landscape conservation cooperatives. This is something, all right. So land, clearly, I'm in a crowd that gets what landscape conservation cooperatives are. I don't have to go into that. But uh, first, a concept of the Fish and Wildlife Service embraced by the Department of Interior embraced by universities and NGOs and other partners, and really at the beginning stages of what I think will be uh, a very long and storied history in this company, country, rather, as we, <laughs> sorry, still not quite out of the private sector, <laughs> this country as we, as we move forward. So together with all kinds of amazing brains, many of the amazing brains in the, are in this room, I can tell it's bursting with wisdom already. They provide science and technical expertise for conservation planning. Most importantly, they provide collaboration. Dan Ash and I were in Wyoming uh, with Governor Mead uh, and others looking at efforts on the ground there. And Dan said, you know, what we've got here, and this was around sage grouse conservation and sage, sage of our steppe ecosystem, but he said, we're moving into a period of time of epic collaboration. Epic collaboration, that is in fact exactly where, they are, where we are. So landscape conservation cooperatives promote this epic collaboration. It's states, it's tribes, it's the federal family, all of us in our silos that we're trying to knock down, but you know, silos have thick walls. Uh, it's nonprofit organizations like the Nature Conservancy and so many others that are represented in this room. It's universities. It's stakeholders on the ground, it's private industries, it's caring citizens, it's all of that. So we have 22 landscape conservation cooperatives across the continent, including the Pacific Islands and the Caribbean. 
And there's many examples of their work, and it's just the beginning of what these LCCs are going to do. I was at uh, the um, Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge in Iowa. I was on the ground looking at the great work happening within that refuge in the tall grass prairie and bringing back bison and understanding these ecosystems and nurturing uh, habitat for pollinators like the monarch butterfly that is struggling to find milkweed these days because of the brown deserts that we have in so many of our agricultural lands in that region. I know that the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie and Big Rivers LCC recognize we got a big problem with hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico and that problem stand, extends hundreds and hundreds of miles north in the tributaries of the Mississippi River and other major rivers that uh, are causing that problem. USGS, uh, Purdue University, Oregon State University, the Northeast Climate Science Center uh, as part of the Department of Interior have been working together to understand this, to bring real science, real recommendations on the ground so we can get up those tributaries to those landowners, to those organizations to make a difference. The Arctic uh, Landscape Conservation Cooperative it is epic collaboration between two countries, multiple federal agencies between those countries, state of Alaska, uh, provinces in Canada, tribes, boroughs, uh, five universities, eight nonprofit organizations all coming together to say, we've got some issues in the Arctic, and we do. I have seen uh, big chunks of land fall into the ocean because they are being battered for much longer periods of time by um, by the uh, seas up there. I have seen many, many polar bears on the shore, but no babies uh, because they couldn't make the swim. Uh, we have profound changes going on, and the Arctic is really a, a focal point, and the landscape conservation cooperatives are helping us understand that. So they play a critical role, a neutral convening forum, a place for multiple players to identify climate and conservation priorities, and you have to prioritize. You can't do everything. Otherwise, you end up doing nothing, at least nothing well. They can identify the science needs, and they can engage in, can engage in organizations like universities, uh, Department of Interior Climate Science Centers, USDA science hubs, to figure out what are the questions we need to answer, and then answer those questions. And I will say, yesterday, as I read the news clips for the Department of Interior, I was really discouraged by one of those snarky reports from some of our friends on Capitol Hill about they can't believe how um, a scientific study was commissioned to watch grass grow. I don't know if any of you caught that, hopefully not. But I thought, well, you know, if it was farmers trying to understand the rate of growth of their crops, would that be okay? Why is it not okay if it's land management organizations trying to understand in this time of climate change what kind of grasses will grow, how fast will they grow, how fast can we regain these ecosystems, what can we do to offset the impact that we've had so far. So that work is important, and I've got your backs, even if you're watching Grass Grow. <laughs> so climate change is upon us in every dimension. But the second, second thing we're doing about it in Interior are strategic investments in landscapes. Investments mean money. And it's something that we have had, in part, in large part, due to a very visionary Congress 50 years ago, that 88th Congress, that 88th Congress that brought us the Civil Rights Act, that 88th Congress that brought us the Wilderness Act, and that 88th Congress that brought us the Land and Water Conservation Act. And along with that, it is an early effort at landscape level mitigation. It said if we're going to develop these resources offshore, largely in, Gulf, in the Gulf of Mexico and California, they're going to have an impact, and don't we know that now? because of Deepwater Horizon. They're going to have an impact. So if they have that impact, let's mitigate that impact by putting money from the oil and gas revenue that the federal government generates into projects onshore through the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And I know that you are aware that that fund needs to be reauthorized in 2015. And if it's not, it expires at the end of next year. We believe it also needs, beyond reauthorization, full and permanent funding at the $900 million level that it was intended to be funded at. Thank you. I know you're the choir. Make sure that those who represent you, if you're allowed to do that in your professions, know how you feel. 
Um, let me give you a few examples of that. The longleaf pine habitat in the southeastern U.S. used to be 90 million acres. We're now down to 4.4 million acres. Uh, it is fragmented. I've flown over part of that when I went to visit Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge, not too far outside of Charleston. We have a multi-agency goal, largely with uh, USDA, to raise that range from 4.4 million acres to 8 million acres by 2020. Through the Land and Water Conservation Fund over the last two years, we've invested $21 million in that effort, very, very important to the southeastern ecosystems. We have $55 million pending in requests in the 2015 budget. So we hope we have a budget. At least we have a continuing resolution. We're open. I didn't have to cancel on you like I did last year on a number of speaking engagements. We have $73 million uh, spent over the last uh, two years in the crown of the continent, recognizing that that nugget, that keystone set aside in Roosevelt's era of Yellowstone National Park was not enough for the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, or more, more importantly, the Yellowstone to Yukon ecosystem as ungulates and um, grizzly bears and wolves migrate across boundaries. Uh, and sometimes not good things happen to them across boundaries. Uh, we know that. So understanding our ecosystems is really critical. And $73 million over two years from the LWCF has helped us do things like work with private landowners to uh, work on conservation easements on their lands. And I've been out with some of those private landowners uh, in that greater Yellowstone ecosystem, and they're doing a terrific job. California southwestern desert, $11 million was invested in fiscal 14. $34 million is pending in the 15 budget for wilderness inholdings and priority parcels in that critical desert habitat. So there's lots going on, and uh, we know that you and we will invest that money wisely if we're given that opportunity by Congress. We also know it will drive the economies of the states that benefit, which is why I've been stumping around the country with mayors and governors and other elected officials, because everybody benefits when we put land into the lands that are important to them. Third thing I want to talk about is wildlife habitat. I gave a shout out to Jim Lyons a little earlier and his uh, partner in Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and that's Michael Bean. Uh, as Dan said when we were in Wyoming together, epic collaboration is going on across the West. We have had, uh, we used to have sagebrush steppe ecosystems throughout 14 states. We're down to 11 states. As I stood on a hilltop in Idaho and I looked at the um, Murphy fire that took out 1,000 square miles of sagebrush steppe ecosystem in a few days with a wildland fire that is now just grass, you really get a perspective of how critical that ecosystem is that I was looking at on the other side that I could see that was intact. So we are working very collaboratively with all kinds of partners on this sagebrush steppe ecosystem. The Western Governors Association is very active. I was with Governor Mead in Wyoming. I was with Governor Otter in Idaho. 11 Western states collaborating together in an unprecedented way to support the sagebrush steppe ecosystem. Why? Well, one of the reasons is another act. 40 years old, the Endangered Species Act, because there is a candidate for listing, and that is the greater sage grouse. But the important thing about these ecosystems, and every one of these governors gets it, is it's not about one bird. It's about mule deer. It's about pronghorn antelope, which, by the way, were conveniently migrating right behind me and Governor Mead as we were speaking in Wyoming. <laughs> and it could have been just a few years ago a mass slaughter going on behind us because the state of Wyoming put in a wildlife crossing because they understand that these pronghorn antelopes need to migrate. It's a landscape level view, but it was very convenient actually to make a point with pronghorn antelopes <laughs> dancing in the background. This habitat's important for them. It's important for golden eagles. Uh, mule deer are, are uh, another species that's uh, feeling pressure. And when we think about sagebrush, it's really like thinking about those old growth forests. It doesn't really mature until 150 years it won't really regenerate as good habitat for 50 years. So when we lose it to wildland fire or invasive species or juniper, uh, which encroaches on those landscapes, and I've seen that too, we're really losing it for potentially 150 years. So there's incredible work going, across, going on across the country, incredible work including industry, recognizing that 70% of the development opportunities that people want to do, particularly for things like oil and gas, are in non-critical areas. So let's focus on those non-critical areas and put the habitat that's critical aside. That's the kind of work that landscape planning, landscape level planning gives us. And it is, in fact, working. Which brings me to the fourth topic, which is balanced energy development. 
Sometimes I say I don't, I'm not the Secretary of Interior, I'm the Secretary of Conflict because there's lots of conflict within the Department of Interior. Energy development tends to be at the epicenter of that. And uh, I have seen great strides working with industry, uh, working with states, working on others to really look at uh, landscape level mitigation. Lynn mentioned my first secretarial order, which was on landscape level, level mitigation, setting that as a priority for all of our departments across Interior to work on moving from a project to project basis to a more predictable and effective landscape level management. We've had an amazing, ambitious example of that with the Desert Renewable Energy Conservation Plan. 22 and a half million acres in the California desert that now has been mapped out. You, can, you will be able to go and look at a tool similar to what I mentioned in chat, uh, the critical, crucial habitat assessment tool where you can see who owns the land, um, where the critical habitat areas are for the desert tortoise, for other species, where the solar energy development zones are, where we will expedite development of solar energy or wind energy, uh, where the areas are that are off limits for a variety of reasons. And that's the beginning. We've seen it in the National Petroleum Reserve in Alaska. Uh, we've seen it in offshore, uh, in wind energy in particular, on the uh, Atlantic seaboard. The BLM is working on master leasing plans. I think we've got seven of them alone in Utah. We are at a new age. So I'm going to wrap this up by saying these activities take a village a village of committed citizens that are willing to listen to each other's points of view, sit around a table together, and come to a common understanding of what we see in these landscapes. So climate change, strategic investments in landscapes, wildlife habitat, balanced energy development, these are a handful of things we're working on. None of them get done without collaboration. And if you think of it as a circle, people on the ground feel impacts. The fishermen in the Gulf Coast feel impacts of the work upland that is creating hypoxia in the Gulf. They work with scientists to understand why. That's part of the work of, that a lot of you are doing. They work with land managers to create actionable tools to do the right thing. And then they work with federal, state, and local leaders to create good policy that supports sensible management of our landscapes. And they work with people on the ground to implement those, and that circle continues. You are part of a big circle. You're part of that village, and I will say the one thing I would ask you to do as you go around that circle together is to take a child by the hand, to take them with you on this journey. Any millennials out there in the audience born between 1980 and 1995? Raise your hands. Okay, great, yes. Let's give the millennials a hand. <laughs> the baby boom is uh, getting older. I'm right in the middle of it, I'm 58. I won't guess where Lynn is, but she's probably in this, at least the same generation I am. Uh, a lot of us are. There's a lot of wisdom that's been created over these years, and we need to impart that to new generations. Gen Xers, I know you're out there. There's not enough of you to take over. Um, you're only 49 million. Sorry, baby boomers, 76 million. You're 49. Uh, millennials, 79 million. And of course, generations coming up behind them. Millennials care. We need to make sure we make room for them in these projects. I'd like to see a lot more hands go up in the room the next time you organize one of these gym, although you're probably retiring from organizing conferences, <laughs> at least until you get a few uh, months past the pain of putting this on. But um, we've got to engage the next generation. And so it's a call to action for all of you. If you have children, to make sure your children or your grandchildren uh, go into the outdoors, first to play, then to recognize that uh, the best classroom on this planet is the one with no walls, and that is Mother Nature. We have lots of opportunities we're working on to engage kids in public service, and uh, over time, um, they will also see opportunities to work, and that is a big part of an initiative that we have at the Department of Interior, our youth initiative, and I encourage you to be part of that journey with us. So thank you for all of the work you're doing on landscape-level understanding, landscape-level conservation, epic collaboration, because it is the wave of the future. You will be the pioneers as Theodore Roosevelt was a pioneer early in the last century. So uh, let's make it happen. Thank you.
That was fabulous. And, and Secretary, by the way, I've reached that age where I've started subtracting the years. Uh, perfect. I'm, I'm going to join uh, So we do have time for questions. There are three people that have microphones. So if you would please raise your hand if you have a question and wait till you get that microphone to then ask it. And while that is happening, so let me have folks right now raise your hands. One right over there. Uh, one over here, one back there. Get the mics to it. But I'm going to launch, uh, while those mics are on their way, a first question, Secretary. You mentioned science. You mentioned tools. You mentioned the incredible energy and motivation around epic collaboration. What do you see as your biggest forward motion challenges in sustaining and carrying forward and broadening these efforts on the ground? And I'll try and answer quickly, which is not my specialty. Um, <clears throat> The biggest challenge we have is inertia. It's getting people to look beyond the way they've always done things. It's to look forward as opposed to look backward. And that is always a challenge. It was a challenge in the private sector to say, let's stop doing things the way we've always done them. Let's look at something new. And I think that that's all of our challenge, but it's going to be really critical. And one of the things I say to my team, there's three main impacts uh, that we have at the Department of Interior we can do uh, little or nothing about. One is climate change. We're working on that. One is this generational transformation I talked about with youth. But the third is constrained resources. And if there's one benefit that we have to having a crappy budget, it is that it forces you to do things differently. And so we're going to embrace that. And I encourage all of you to embrace that too, saying we're not going to have the money that we want. So without having the money that we want, how do we do things in a more effective way? And that is what LCCs are about. It's what this collaboration is about. And I think that that will help force us uh, to go forward in a way that may have been harder when, uh, when times were a little better on the budget front. So if you have a mic, please raise it high. All right. Uh, uh, we'll take the gentleman back there first. Thank you. Thank you for that speech, Secretary Jewell. This is Chris Miller from Piedmont Environmental Council. Two questions. Uh, most of the people in the United States live in the east, and how can we work on large landscapes in the east of the Mississippi? And related to that, uh, in addition to the effect of energy generation, is the huge impact of linear utility constructions and highways. And what can the, the next generation of land and water conservation fund to address the use of eminent domain uh, without any large offset for the landscape level impacts of those utilities? Great. Thank you for those two questions. Um, I'm going to take them fast if I can. Um, yeah, what's interesting is uh, I never get any pushback in the East when we talk about the importance of the Land and Water Conservation Fund and picking up parcels of land. I was out with uh, Senator Burr in North Carolina, and he was uh, lobbying hard for full permanent funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And the example that we hiked to, which was along the Appalachian Trail, it's Appalachian if it's south of here. Uh, it's Appalachian if it's north, just so you know. I see Ron Tipton out there. He helped educate me. Um, they know that land is hard to come by. They know that Shenandoah and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, for the most part, were eminent domain plays. And there's still bitter taste in the mouth of a lot of Easterners because the lands are predominantly private here. Large landscape conservation here is, in some ways, perhaps more difficult, but in some ways more uh, important because so much is at stake. You see it in the health of the Chesapeake Bay. And that is a large landscape conservation project that is making forward progress. I heard a few days ago along the Delaware River going from the upland watersheds down to Delaware Bay. I think that it will be different than it is in the West, but no less important than it is in the West. And I think it's part of all of our jobs to help educate landowners. So I'm going to give you a quick example. Uh, I was just out in Cape May a few weeks ago where the Fish and Wildlife Service, working with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, working with the local mayors of the communities, working with local community citizens, quickly threw sand on the beach that had been taken down to peat because they knew that the uh, horseshoe crabs were coming in, which was a critical on the flyway for uh, red knots and other birds. Um, community coming together, recognizing after Hurricane Sandy that they had a big dog problem. Now with the science, they understand that they've had subsidence. They need to build up some of those wetland ecosystems. They have opportunities to plant there. They're engaging the community. Uh, they're engaging private landowners. And people are taking ownership in that. And I think that that's going to be the key across the country, but particularly in the east, uh, because you have a lot of complexity. 
but you also have a lot of desire. We saw with Sandy again a great opportunity where Mother Nature protected inland communities. People want protection. That protection can come better from a wildlife refuge in a wetland than from uh, a, uh, a grayscape that uh, can get overrun, which then keeps the water in instead of letting the water go out. On the energy side, um, I think it's much harder to use eminent domain now than it was in the past, and I think that that will continue, and I think large landscape conservation is going to be really important. We need energy. We're probably sitting under coal-fired lights right now. Um, I imagine our food was prepared either with electricity or natural gas, uh, both burning fossil fuels, and I'm sure you all used fossil fuels when you got here. So uh, it's not easy. We're all part of the problem. We all need to work on solutions. But I think the next generation of energy development will be much smarter. So knowing in advance where we can site transmission lines without a lot of conflict uh, with wildlife, with people, and so on is really critical because that'll help us identify where those plants go. Going with more distributed generation as opposed to massive plants will help uh, with that because it reduces our risk to uh, problems in our energy infrastructure. These are things that the Department of Energy works on, but they work hand in glove with what we're trying to do on landscapes. So those are a few concepts, uh, and, I, and I know if I keep going on, we won't get to any of the other questions, and we have several mics out there. Lynn? Yeah, uh, if you have a mic, uh, right over here, we'll go. And, and then if you have a question, make sure that the mic gets transferred to you. So we'll go here and then right here. Thank you very much for your comments, Secretary. I'm Matthew Anderson, USGS. I, I appreciate your comments have been supportive of the LCCs. I think they've already documented a great deal of success. I believe that they have great potential to continue to be even more successful into the future. As one of the people down the line from you, I think you're probably aware our appropriations for those are not going very well. Mm -hmm. To the extent that you can give us guidance on how to address that or to support you in addressing that, we would really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll uh, definitely put it on my list. Um, it's to say that our budget situation is beyond frustrating would be an understatement. But I think that uh, there are people out in the community that we can lean into that can help be influential on that. And we're certainly going to lean into all those friends that we have. And I think with uh, the work that we do in terms of the presidential budget, I feel good about where we're going. So thanks for bringing that up. Gentleman here. Um, created a 1,700-mile uh, climate corridor in 2007. Uh, and in, in response to the question about doing something for the East Coast, what about a climate wildlife corridor that follows the AT? Okay. Um, I should flip that to Ron Tipton at the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Um, Australia was what he said before the mic actually turned on. Australia has created a 1,700-mile long uh, wildlife corridor. You know, it's a, it's a good concept. I think what we um, need to understand is what are, where does the wildlife want to go? And that's a big part of understanding our landscapes. Like I was talking about with Yellowstone, certainly Yellowstone was an island unto itself, and without the capacity to migrate, you're going to get, uh, you're not going to get genetic diversity in the animals there, and eventually uh, you're going to have problems. I think that what we need to do, rather than uh, maybe going with, with what I would say would maybe be simplified, which is let's call that a wildlife corridor. Let's figure out what the critical wildlife migration routes are, and let's make sure those are protected. In Wyoming, where I was standing, before they had that wildlife crossing that the state of Wyoming paid for, it was about 100 miles wide. It was just a bridge over the road. Literally, the pronghorn antelope were getting slaughtered by the hundreds, if not thousands, as they ran out onto the freeway. Uh, so, you know, I think that there are places like that. In my own, uh, I talked about the Mountains to Sound Greenway early on. Um, few places where wildlife could cross. It really became the fast food restaurant for cougars and other uh, um, predators because they all had to come through there if they were going to migrate at all. So then you don't get the migration and you split, uh, you split the populations. So I, I think that um, there is a balance between what we need to do for science, scientific purposes, and what our opportunities are to do for public awareness. And it's something like the AT would probably be great for public awareness. Uh, we need to make sure that those are blended. Um, but it's certainly open to those kinds of suggestions. And we welcome those if you want to send them into the department for, uh, for consideration. So sec well, Secretary Jim is uh, giving me some waving signs. So I think we're going to have to wrap up. But let's give another round of applause for Secretary Jewell.
that, that was a great honor to have such an eloquent secretary come and talk to all of us.